Alrighty, ladies and gents, you know what? Here we are. Brenton's coming. Daniel, welcome. Da There's another Daniel. Daniel White, Elisa, Greg, thanks for joining us. Let me turn that off. Uh, Kim, Michael, Philip, long time no see. I hope you're well. Robert, Simon, Barb's, how are you going? Tyson, mate, thank you very much for that. Looking forward to catching up and going through that next week. Hey, guys, let's kick this off because I'm really excited about this. Again, just a reminder. I'd love to sort of get from you any questions that pop up along the way, because we're going to cover a lot of ground. Uh, this is going to be one of those sort of off-piste, open-ended sort of conversations, and there's so much area we can we can focus on and get through, because, um, yeah, Sasha's just got so much to share about the way she does business, and there's so much so much in the background that we could talk about. I'd love to know. Let's kick this off. I just want to give me a sense. Pop, just open the chat box and make sure that everything's working. If if the audio is good and the, the you can see everything okay and, and oh, that's all right, can you do me a favor? Just jump into the chat box and just type in yes or good to go or G to G or just something to make sure that, you know, I'm not bouncing, my echo is not bouncing off the walls and that you can hear me and all the rest of it. And we also know that the chat box is working. So just head over. Chat is dis chat's disabled. Oh, that's unusual. Huh. How annoying. Okay. Well, we're not going to use the chat then. We're going to have to use the Q&A. Jen? Don't know why the chat's disabled. Anyway, let's let's kick on with it. So yeah, until we can get the chat working, we'll have to go by the Q and A. Tyson, thank you very much, Daniel. I appreciate it. So do me a favor, Jen. Lovely. Uh, good to go. This works. Okay, perfect. Yeah, lovely. So I'd love to just quickly know before we kick it off. Hey, Rachel, how are you going? What's the number one reason that you were drawn to come and 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 sort of attend this to hear from Sasha? What's the thing that either caught your attention or the main thing that you wanted to learn off the back of it or the or the number one thing that you know of all the things we could talk about what was the thing that that drew you in just so i can take this in in the in the right direction and, and ask the right questions and all the rest of it again if you wouldn't mind pop it in the q a until we can get the chat box up and running and uh give me a bit of a sense of what you what what's brought you here what you want to hear about that's how i look what have we got thanks brenton awesome yeah, all okay. Good. Yep. Happy for you to use Q&A. Daniel, what's the main reason that you, you're here today? What's the main driver? Here we go. It sounds like an innovative advice process. That it is. That it is. Yeah. And we're going to dive into the strategy piece and using technology for client engagement. Love that. Uh, seems to be doing something similar to what I'm doing. I'm interested to learn how we differ. Totally, Daniel. See, Daniel, Daniel, we've got two Daniels next to each other. Daniel White, see, to see certain uses of technology, we'll dive into the tech. Beautiful. Okay, so we've got a couple of things going on. Tyson, it's strongly aligned to what our vision is. Yeah, man, it is really strongly aligned to what you do. Very much so. Okay, so before we kick in, let me give you a bit of a sort of introduction to Sasha in case you don't know. Sasha is the founder of Birchart Financial uh, Financial Planning, and she leads a really, really good team. We were just talking about some of the things they've been doing um, recently. Uh, that kind of takes an approach to, I guess, her proposition is very much around sort of uh, advice as being about lifestyle and happiness and that sort of thing. She's also an award-winning advisor, having won uh, the Affinia Advisor in, uh, Practice of the Year in 2016. She was a finalist for the Advisor of the Year in 2022. She won, I think, the a uh, finalist in the NAB Women in Finance Awards and the AFA Female Excellence in Advice Awards in 2017. Not to mention the fact I know she's deeply involved in the Finia. She's also, man, she's got a culinary talent and an eye for design that I personally am very jealous of. And she also lives in one of Sydney's up hottest up-and-coming neighborhoods, so I'm told. But um, yeah, but today I really wanted to dive in and talk to you a bit about her, her process, her bit practice, and also sort of how she's grown it and a whole bunch of other stuff. So without any further ado, Sasha, are you there? Hello, how are you? I'm, I'm extremely well. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Hi, everyone. No, I love that chair in the background. And the reason I love that chair in the background is because I think it's been in the background of a few of these in the, in, in the past. Yes. So it's a nice one. Look, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining me on this because I know it's a, I know you're, you are, you've been busy, uh, quite busy recently, right? Yes, indeed. I think, I think you everyone mentioned, has. There's so many clients at the moment, not enough advisors to service them. So, yeah, I think what well, I don't, I read some numbers around it and I think what are we, 35, 40% down since it began yeah. and, and it's more to come. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a shocker. But, um, this is one of those ones where I'm just like, we, we could, we could start anywhere and end anywhere and we keep going. So I'm going to, I'm going to try and sort of, Get as much as I possibly can out in the hour, but um, for in the in the in the un, in the unlikely event that sort of people don't know sort of who you are, they don't know anything about you, they don't know anything about Birchart. Can you give us a bit of an overview of kind of what the business is all about, who you work with, 
and kind of how it works in the background. Sure, no problem. So I started uh, Burkhart in 2014. Um, I've had my own business since 2011, but I was contracting to other advice practices. And then I made the decision as why am I doing this for everyone else when I could be doing it for myself? So I started um, the journey just thinking that at that time I'd have a small pocket of clients and be able to drive my um, kindergarten daughter to school every day, drop her off and have that really relaxing lifestyle. Fast forward, rapid growth stage. Um, I didn't get to drop her to school that often, but that's okay. Um, I still cook her dinner every night. So um, she's now in uh, year seven. So she gets herself to school. Um, she's um, a fully equipped teenager. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been quite the journey. But my goal, obviously, since I started was to educate um, people in the advice process. Um, we get so caught up in the jargon of life. Um, yeah. Times we forget that we do this every single day. So I'm I'm a very pictures driven person. Even when my husband wanted to renovate our house, I'm like, you got to draw it for me, otherwise. <laughs> it. Um, so I draw pictures to my clients. I um, I tell stories. I give advice through stories, and um, that's worked really well for for us. Was your intention always from the beginning to be an advisor, or did you kind of just fall into that direction through circumstance? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I got into the superannuation industry um, back in, I'm going to give away my age now, in the late um, 90s. And uh, I um, worked in quite a few advice practices and then some big superannuation companies. And then okay. I thought at the time, advice industry, and I did all my study back then as well, that it was boring, you know. I wanted to be in sales, marketing, <laughs> advertising, and then I studied marketing and I worked in a marketing um, firm for quite some time. I got sick in my early 20s and um, was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, so my kind of career took a very big stop for a couple wow. of years whilst I recovered. Um, and in that time, um, my my um, father used to be an insurance broker, so the boys were covered, but the girls weren't. Um, so my brother was a snowboarder and um, the girls were ballet dancers and actors. And stuff. So, um, <laughs> oh, okay. The boys are fine, but I, I was the one that got leukemia. So um, at that wow. time, um, yeah, so it's been quite the journey and I'm a big advocate for risk um, and not to over-insure, but just to give people the what if. So that was one big thing. And another thing is I come from a, um, a divorced family and, um, it was a very messy divorce um, yep. and my mum walked away with nothing and a lot of women sometimes and sometimes men because sometimes women are now the um, yep. the money earners of the family or they pay all the bills. Um, so it's that education piece to bring the whole family involved into what's happening so you can make those kind of decisions together rather than just going, oh, no, my husband does that or my, my wife does that. It's, it's funny because that must give you a very um, strong perspective on what it's like to go through that kind of life-changing thing, not to mention when things break. I, I'm the same. My, my parents divorced quite messily. And they're like I've, one of the things that's driven me has been I know that when businesses are done well, they, they can provide financial rewards for people. But when they're not, the opposite happens. It can often lead to sort of breakup and everything. So it kind of gives you a perspective. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not even in terms of breakup. It, it could be um, business relationships. Yeah. Um, with partners and stuff. So structure is key. So it's all about that education piece on why structure is so in important in your everyday life, but also in your business or your employee life. So I'm getting a sense that you kind of started outside the industry, you've done the marketing piece, and then you've come kind of close to the advice. But I mean, was your intention always to be a business owner? Was that something you really wanted to do? No. Or did just... Gosh, okay. no, absolutely not. Um I, I knew I wanted more after I got well, I got back into marketing and then fell. I met my husband and I kept falling into marketing jobs and he was a pilot and fairly busy and we were living um, South Coast for a long time. Um, and then when we moved back to Sydney or he got posted to Sydney because he was defence at the time, um, I was like, I want to do something more. Um, I had Misha. I went back into yep. the world of marketing and corporate marketing, so big corporate business and you know, I don't know, um, but for me, my experience wasn't so great. They wouldn't let me come back part-time after having yeah. me. Couldn't find childcare in Sydney because you've got to have your name on the list before yeah. you even think about having a baby. Um, so these are the, 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 
the types of things that kind of had lots of road stops for me. And um, my, my stepmom had to step aside to take some time off work to help look after Misha whilst I yeah. worked. So in that time, I went back to study and went, well, what do I want to do? And I always knew I wanted to help people. And I wasn't going to start training to be a doctor, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> and I am good with numbers. And when I look back at all my roles in marketing, I was in the, I was always the one to do the accounts or the financials or anything of any of the businesses that I worked in. So that financial kind of realm kind of always was a high point and it was just helping people understand that and what that looks like. Um, so I decided to create Burkhart. I never thought it would go to where it is today. I, I don't think anyone ever you know, no. thinks with the end in mind. Um, and it has been an evolving process. My team laugh because I'm constantly changing things because that's the way my brain works. I've always yeah. been strategy first, process driven, service everything later. So it's always I wake up in the middle of the night and say, "Oh my gosh, why?" Oh, halfway through a statement of advice, "Oh, we could do this," <laughs> and then go back to the drawing board. Yeah, it's um, I I have I'm a bit of a tinkerer, and the problem is I have to, sometimes have to. Jen's actually really good at it. She, she's Brit, as I guess your team would be. She has to stop it and go, that's a great idea, but let's park it over there and let's revisit it. And, and sometimes you come back to it three months later and it's like, oh, I don't like that anymore, yeah. which is a good thing. So Birch, like Birch Heart is a derivative of your name, correct? Or your, well, your Yes. So I um, did a rebrand um, a couple of years in. So I started the, um, the business and it was called Specialized Advice because that's what okay. I believed I did. I, I gave people specialized advice and I have um, a lot of SMSF strategies and so forth. Right. Um, over time, I met a marketing lady and she's like, no, Sasha, that's boring. I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> we'll do a rebrand. And she put a couple of different names. I'm like, I'm not changing the name. I'm not changing the name. And then she put yep. a card in front of me. And Burkhart is the way you actually pronounce my surname. Okay. Um, the Bir so, uh, Birchgart is how it sounds or is spelt. And that is um, my name. And then my marketing said, well, how about we change the gut to heart? <laughs> so, okay, um, yeah. So then my licensee changed my name. <laughs> Some of the insurance companies changed my name. So it's been a little bit of a disaster. People will try to search <laughs> Sasha Birchgar, um, but spell it Birchart, <laughs> and then I don't exist. So then there's that, are you really an advisor? So... <laughs> yes, I do. The, the whole premise of the name change was, well, I can create a brand rather than just a book of business. So let's yeah. brand. And then it was, okay, well, why, what do you do? And I, I do. I put my heart and soul into every single one of my clients. I, what happens to them personally affects me. Um, yeah. And they, they all would say the same, um, especially the, like the key clients that we work with day to day. So Burkhart was born and, um, yeah, and it's still and challenging with banks and getting my email address right. You, know, <laughs> you say, can you send, I haven't got the email yet, so. Well, I, I was writing down, I was like, oh, there's a G in there. And then I had yeah. to, do I drop the E or do I drop the, yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. but so I got there. I got, and then the organ, right? Yeah, that's right. It's like, but then, okay, is it Burton? Yeah, it's what, but I got there in the end. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the business because um, the way you give advice is kind of, we, when we were talking through what we were going to talk about, a few things came up. It was firstly the way that you use modeling and numbers. It's mm -hmm. almost religiously and more specifically cash flow. And this this process that you've developed for, for really making the strategy paper such a massive part of it, not to mention there's a whole bunch of stuff flying around the edge. So what I wanted to start off by, have you always given advice in this way? And if not, how, when did it start to form? So, um, no, I haven't. So when we started, um, you all go down the same channel, you meet a client, you provide them, you fill out the fact find, and then the next time they come back to you, you're presenting them with a statement of advice. And it's very meet, advice, deliver, meet, advice, deliver. Yep. I would get through halfway to a statement of advice and eyes would be going over, uh, gla eyes would glaze over because obviously they're long-winded um, documents that have a lot of jargon in them. Yeah. And... I would like to give clients choice. So what if you did this? Or what if you did this? Or this is what you came to me for. But if we restructure it this way, this is the difference. And that really doesn't work in the statement of advice world because then the document ends up being 6,000 pages as opposed to yeah. you know, 
50 in my license say, um, that they've got shorter now, depending on the advice. But um, yeah, it got to the stage where I kept having to go back to the team and say, no, we need to rewrite this now because we're going to go this, this and this. So I, I started saying, look, I would like to do another meeting pre-advice to just um, kind of work out the strategies, but in a more granular um, fashion. So I find if someone tells me what to do, I'm more like, well, you know, I kind of have my own idea. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Um, and then will I buy into what someone tells me to do when I've already had a pretty strong feeling about what I want to do anyway? So we live in a society where you get advice on everything, when you should start having babies. I think we talked about that earlier, or when you should get married or when you should settle down or, um, you know, you get these little pockets of advice and then that, yeah. that flows through to pockets of advice from the guy on the bus the guy at the barbecue, you should do this. Oh, no, I've got my super with here. No, I'm doing really well. You should do this. So there's all of these advice things flying around across the edge. So clients come to you and not all, but a lot do and say, oh, look, this is what I've been told to do or this is what my friends yeah. do. This is what my mum and dad, this is my money story. This is this. Um, and I feel that I need to give them um, the choice okay, well, this is the way you should do it, but is there a better way or is there an alternative or is this going to make you okay? So I started this um, to, to cash flow that out. So this is what you came to me for. This is what the likely outcome may be. Yeah. But what if we did this? and Or what if we did this? And then, okay, well, what if we do a combination of both? Okay. So yes, there's a lot more, as we, we talked, it's a lot more high touch because... A lot of outsourced power planners, which we've struggled with over the years, struggle to do that because they'll come back and say, yeah, but why would we do that? That's not going to work for them. It puts them in a worse situation. But clients don't know that. They, Yes, we do that work in the background, but they yeah. don't know that. They can't see that. So let me let me play it back to you, make sure I've got it the right way. So if I come to you and I'm like, okay, I want to pay for a giant swan to be put in my backyard. That's been my home dream. And on top of that, I want to move all of my memorabilia that's hanging on my wall in my garage. I want to move it into, you know, the the into the self. And I'll give you all of these things. You're gonna go, okay, I'll go away. I'm gonna model that and I'm gonna come and put it in front of you. And then I'm gonna show you the consequences of, of what you're talking about without any judgment, without any yeah. is that what's going on here? Yeah, well, if, if I mean, something's extreme, but if that is extreme, if someone wants to put memorabilia in this SMS, I'll say, well, you can't really <laughs> you do can't that. do that. <laughs> Just take it off the walls. Yeah. Um, so rule stuff, I'll say, look, that's you know, you can't buy a, a lifestyle property and use it in your SMSF. You know that you can't rent it to your daughter. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of stuff, I wouldn't bother modelling out. I'll just say, look, these are the rules. Um, but. If, Simple stuff, like I'm going to put all my money into my mortgage and pay that off first and I'm not going to Got do it. any other strategies. So I'll go, yep, this is, well, this is how much interest you're going to save and this is how much how much time you're going to shave off your mortgage. And this is very basic vanilla type stuff. Um, and then the next one I'll go, okay, well, what if you put all that money into super instead? This yep. is how, how long it'll take to pay your mortgage off and this is potentially how, how much you'll grow your retirement. Or what if we do a portion of both? And if Got you do, it. and then th th this was very basic stuff at the beginning with um, kind of lower net wealth clients. Well, what does that look like? Um, clients then can see, okay, well, yes, I'm going to pay my mortgage off in eight years as opposed to 26 years. Okay. Um, I'm going to save $270,000 in interest. Or then we would go, well, look, if you do a combination of both, you're still going to pay off your mortgage in around 13 years but you're also going to give yourself this much more in retirement potentially, which means you you, you close that gap a lot faster um, by holding, the, doing a multiple strategy. So that's at a very basic type strategy level. Yep. Um, some clients want to buy, invest, should I invest in property? Should I buy new versus existing? Should I develop? Should I go into the share market? It, it, it is a, a very what if type scenario. So the obvious Obviously, I mean, first, I want to go back because I, I, I'm going to guess the way you started off doing it was way less efficient than what you're doing right now. There's probably, I mean, there would have been no, like technology wasn't there. The paper, we'll, we'll go back to that. But I mean, as a process, that must be quite time intensive. Yes. Okay. And how and is that? You, and you've just accepted that that's part of the process and or how do you make sure? Back what are the, right. So what are the but things you do? Charge. 
what are the things that you got to make sure are in place before you take you get to that point with somebody, right? Because you I imagine there's a couple of hurdles you want to get past before you're yeah, going to sit down so and do that one. We structure our advice in three areas. Um, right. The, the strategy, the advice, and then the ongoing if required. So okay. clients know when they sign on their engagement with us, they know they're um, embarking upon a strategy first and that's probably yep. and I explained to them in our introduction meeting that's where we do most of our work um, so it will include their current situation in detail and what their life looks like or may look like if they mm-hmm. don't move forward now and they stay doing what they're doing um, because we want to tell clients a where they are and if they're okay because everyone doesn't know exactly where they are they've got lots of yep. thoughts in there And then secondly, we want to give us, it's kind of like our anchor starting position for us. So every time we review a client, we can show them how far they've come from their current position. It's really nice. Um, We use it as a tool. It's a bit of a scary tool um, because you've got to put your value. If you're not moving forward with a client and helping them grow their wealth or that, or if they're not in the, on the journey with you, you can see fairly quickly if they're not following that type of roadmap. Um, okay. And then, so we would um, then present the, and then the last half of the document, sorry, is all the, the strategies that they want to do just in standalone. So if they want to pay for their kids' education, well, how do they do that? What's it going to cost? Yep. Is it a savings plan? Is it a bond? Da, 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 da. And there's no product recommend, recommendations in this strategy. It's, yes. You, you may be able to do an education strategy. So we've got it all approved by licensee land and, and so forth. Um then the second half of the document, we we go through all the different things, and at the very back, we do a post a potential post implementation cash flow. So if they did all their high priority things, and sometimes even their medium priority things, are they in the red or are they in the green? What's it going to yeah. cost? We do a high, um, a risk analysis as well, worst case scenario. And I say it's not because I'm trying to cover you for everything. It's just that. If something does happen, I want you to know you've had you've considered everything and you know what the steps are if one of you can't work or if one of you passes away. Um, so I that they love this document because once they leave, they like they, they know everything bad, A, if they're okay, what they need to shave back on, and they get a really clear understanding of why their cash flow is so important. Right. Is is it onerous to to get the information off people, get them because not I mean, what percentage of people actually do a budget, would you say? Oh, hardly any. Okay. Um, and to get high level, some people are really good. And I, I mean, I have a lot of um clients who can just go, yeah, no, I've got an Excel spreadsheet on that. So there are some people that are very <laughs> good with doing that. Um, we've actually started a new, we'll, we're implementing a new service where client we just get three months of statements for every single credit card and bank account they have. Yeah. And, in Excel and we can model it into some type of spending, um, but that's not included in this at all. But okay. generally, if you ask clients, look, well, what do you pay on your gas, electricity and water? They'll have a, a rough, rough idea. Park. And we're not asking for absolute because things change. You may spend more some month, some weeks at the groceries. You may spend less. You might go out for dinner more weeks. So as long as we've got an average People know if they're going to have ten, if they've got ten thousand dollars left over at the month, or if they're living months to month. Yeah. People generally know that. Uh, it's when they go, yeah, we've got it, but we don't have this amount of money every year. Yeah, we roughly have that, but I should, I should have seventy thousand stuck in my offset account by this point, and I don't. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a wake up call for clients, um, and that's what we base the rest of the document on. So it's really important right. that we get that number up front otherwise we're wasting so much time building these strategies because they're all cash flow driven some of the banks are getting really good at westpac have recently i don't know if you bank with westpac but i i, I do and some of their, their reporting coming off the back of it is now starting to get pretty good it, it, it kind of it's all bets are off for people who've got multiple banks now that's the problem right there's no, yeah. no but you know csv file send you I, i've done this um for brendan and i recently because you, we, we went and had a lovely holiday the first time in years and then you get back and you're like, oh, gosh, how much are we spending, you know? The cost yeah. of living, everything's going up. What are we spending? And it is actually when you've got business accounts and personal accounts and, and so forth, it's a tedious exercise. But, it is. Um, yeah. But it's useful. And I, don't, I think it's funny because with the pandemic, I almost feel like 
it's something that people haven't had to think about as much because there's and and now it's kind of like oh yeah okay we've got we can't go nuts on that forget that they can just tap 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 on everything with their yeah. pay card and then that's not really included like when brendan and i met um we would put all our money together inst- everything went into the joint account but then we would pay each other an allowance and that's what yeah. was common. And, and you know when your allowance one that ran down you had you, you kind of overspent or but people can't do that now with the tax so it's all about getting that bucket strategy right and making bucket, sure. the bucket strategy is the best i use it for my business I use it for my personal stuff and because ultimately, you know, if you're having to transfer money out to say, okay, there's, there's your, it's, it's such a good system. I love it. Um, I'm going to ask you about when you started off the mm-hmm. technology, but one thing I wanted to ask is people who've gone down the strategy paper route, one of the p- pieces of hurdles they have to come over, get over is convincing their compliance oversights that it's not advice. Mm-hmm. Did you have that problem or were they on board from, from the beginning? Uh, they gave us two tips. So we, we gave the, 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 the strategy paper and as long as it doesn't have any product named mentioned and okay. we, like when we do um, say a super comparison, for instance, and we'll compare every super fund that comes to us. So in our strategy paper, it'll have their current super with their current risk profile and we'll compare apples with apples in that stage. You've got to do it okay. the way anyway. And we've had pretty much 99.9% success rate of getting a client from a strategy to us, um, to um, SOA. Yep. Um, so we, we cash flow that out anyway and then we compare it against two other, a, a retail fund, um, a, an industry fund, and depending on balance and their goals, potentially um, an SMSF. Okay. Um, from a fee structure and then we also do performance and then we break down what that performance what their kind of um, asset allocation is so obviously your asset allocation is this which is either in line or not in line with your risk profile right and we compared it against one like for our retirement like we'll have one that are tailored around of reducing sequency risk and so forth so yeah it, it, we, we try to um give them as much because you can't it's very hard to compare apples with apples in this world and it's getting harder and harder and harder because yeah. no no fund is alike no um investment portfolio is, is alike and no insurance product is alike so the apples for apples is really apples and pears or apples and bananas it doesn't uh, it doesn't exist unless you're the industry super funds advertising advertising you can get away with anything right, That's right. um um i was going to ask you actually when you're since because your model is very much about setting the goal and then deciding what happens, what needs to happen personally, how much you need to save, you know, what. That's right. And then you've got risk profiling, which is based yeah. on a bunch of questions that seek to put you in a, you know, back by nothing. How do you pull those two together? Because ultimately, like, if I've got big dreams, but I'm a, I'm a conservative investor, but I need to shift upwards, how does that work in your world? How do you, co- yes. you know, correlate those two? I use the Vanguard chart a lot in work because it's a great chart to explain risk and return and markets over the last 30 years um, and it also um, draws into what what's happened in those last 30 years so the last 10 months have been crazy in all types of markets so clients know that but yeah. they if we look back at the last 30 years you can still see growth if we look short term we can't so it really depends I'm big on with clients about capacity risk capacity so not just their capacity to take risk which is their sleeping them being able to sleep at night and not panic yeah. But it's their time in market and it's also, um, you know, well, what is that money going to be used for? Is it going to be used to uh, buy a, buy a, your home? Or is it going mm. to be used to buy an investment property? Is it just sitting there to grow your wealth? So if it's sitting there to grow your wealth, we've got a long-term risk capacity. If, if, if markets go all over the place like they've been bouncing around now, we, we've got time in market. Mm. Um, if we're uh, closer to retirement, we would we would potentially have a or in retirement would have a bucket strategy approach in inside of that fund as well. So what that would look like is um, two years times income protected, so they don't have to panic. They've got some time um, for markets to recover, and then yeah. would have a, um, the CPI to you know to, to cover inflation over the next bucket, and then would have some growth assets to obviously grow their wealth. Um, gotcha. So it, it, it depends on client. It's all very client-focused and education-focused. So um, I spend a lot of time, um, I used to hate filling out risk tolerance questionnaires. 
<laughs> but now we've got lots of little pictures about growth and risk and okay. you know, what's happened in the market. You know, everyone thinks 2020 when COVID hit was a terrible year. But if you actually look on paper, you know, this year's been um, <laughs> yeah. great. Um, and, and then obviously the GFC, but they can see the recovery rates. They can see what's happened in all the best and um, worst years over the last 20 or 30 years. And, you know, the markets are still better. Property is still better than cash. So, you right. know, some people have still got their money in cash from the GFC because they're so scared of investing. Yeah, yeah, which just goes to show you how, how, um, how much this sort of stuff is driven by people's perception on, on this thing. Yeah, fear and... Um, well, you can see it in the media now, right? I mean, like I remember when the pandemic hit and it was like, ah, and then everyone was like, oh, it's going to be fine. And it's almost like we've just saved it up for this year and everybody's like, talk, we're talking, I feel like sometimes we're talking ourselves onto the ledge sometimes. Yeah, I do. Uh, how has let's talk about technology because I imagine this process has to be enabled by technology at some level. How has the the technology footprint of this evolved? Yeah, so technology has probably been our biggest hurdle. Like many businesses, um, last year we did an analysis of how much we're actually spending on our tech because yep. different things do um, different programs do different things well. They and do, we've yeah. never been able to find something that compares to X Tools Plus from a cash flow modeling tool. Yep. And also to get your power planners buy in as well. So, um, X Plan is very expensive for small practices to do well, especially if you're going to have um, a login per advisor and then yeah. wealth solver, risk researcher, and X Tools Plus. It's a very expensive exercise. So, um, we used part of X Plan. We've used Astute Will. Um, we've used um, different CRM tools to bring in information, and then we would have different systems. So it was never really. It was very um, hard to find out what our source of truth was. So yep. um, we used Work Sorted, which is a brilliant system. Um, rate it really, really highly. Um, but we found that we were spending like sixty-seven thousand dollars a year on our tech stack. Um, wow, that's a that's a big that's a, a big fund. yeah for a small business it's a lot of money and um, then when you when you reverse engineer that and say okay well let, what 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 products do do it well and then I put it in my team's hands because if you don't get power planner buy in on a system yeah you get pushback so um, we were going down one road prior to me going on holidays and I was ready to sign up because I was a little bit. We just need to make a move. I need to cut costs. Let's everyone, you know, let's. And they trialed the system whilst I was on holidays and they realised that they didn't like it so much, but they didn't want me to come back from holidays with a solution. I'm right. not a good person, I promise. Um, <laughs> um, and um, the team um, looked at um, some other, so Larry, my senior power planner, looked at some other systems, got some demos, trialled it whilst I was away. And then when I came back, he said, look, this is what didn't work well and won't work in with our structure on how we do business. But I found this, this would, I've trialed it, let's trial it a bit longer. And then we've now implemented over the last two months and we are loving it. It is already saving so much time. We've built all our templates um, where we, from SOAs to ROAs, all our workflows um, across the practice. You can't really do in any software system in a couple of like two months. So it, it, we're, we're pretty excited about that. And soon we'll have a lot of our um, strategy paper coded into the software as well. Wow. So that will just be mind blowing. So we've talked a lot about software. And as you mentioned, it's been a bit of a bugbear. Do you feel like it's changing? And if so, why do you think it's changing? Do you think it's not improving at all? I think it's changing. Um, X Plan has been the dominant market um, player for all things. 60% um, market share yeah. for, yeah. yeah. And it's clunky and I get it. It's a legacy type product and they keep adding stuff, but it is at the sole advice practice really, really hard to use. To do it well, you have to get external help to build threads or code documents and so or, forth. And, or have an internal specialist who knows, yeah. yeah or, ha or pay for an internal specialist. And you know, the, the the threads get stuck with one person and then it's missed in a workflow and all that stuff. So there's things that, yeah. you know, and then you can't just quickly jump in to change that because you need someone who's a specialist to jump in and change something that's not working. Um, I'm very big on the whole team knowing the process and so we now mandate every, um, every quarter we go out of office 
spend a day um, in either a hired office. Uh, the last couple of times we've used the towel boardroom and we've just had the whole team there and we're setting up processes, we're writing letters. So we're doing it as a group on a full day and that's what we do. So because we found we would have a day going, yeah, let's get this and this and this and then we'd go back. But Nothing we'd happens. Inundated. Well, we'd be inundated by work. So we'd maybe tick, tick off one or two things. Whereas this way we're ticking off, like when we last did it, we ticked off um, all our agreement, annual agreements, all our mm. engagement offers, all our price pointing. So once a client has had that um, the 15-minute introduction and the um, discovery meeting with me, as soon as that meeting goes, the engagement will go out with what their um, level of service will be for the cost of the strategy, advice and potential ongoing. When we talk about system, because I mean, what's becoming obvious, I kind of knew, but I'm getting even more a sense now that you're very systems orientated, very systemic. Um, who builds most of the systems in your t- in your business now? Are you involved in this or is it mainly others? It's quite funny. I keep telling my team they're trying to make me redundant because um, <laughs> Karen, who's um, in client service and, and also power planning, she's just taken a hold of the process and is a, the process queen, we call her. Um, and she loves it. She's like, don't touch my process, but she explains it all. Then she'll bring it down for us. Um, and then she'll go, look, this goes to you, but it doesn't stop. Because it used to, if everything goes into my inbox and I'm with a client, then it stops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Goes, no, it's just a reminder for you to invoice them. It's not a reminder for anything else. Everything else is happening in the back end, so don't worry about it. Okay. Um, and then we have a, a every Monday we have a, a meeting, so we can export everything from our system, and then we've got drop down lists. So everything that's in strategy phase, prospect phase, um, statement of advice stage, implementation stage, invoice stage, we can see it at power planner level. So we've got one, two, three power planners, um, two client services, and a back office support as well. Yeah. So. Um, we all know at a high level what's in everyone's workflow, but then we also know at a granular, granular level who's being assigned to what. Yeah. And nothing can get missed. And they joke, they're like, Sasha, nothing needs to touch you, but we've got a few bugs in the system so you don't get rid of us because, you know, we know how to fix the system. So it's, <laughs> but re- it's really good. Um, I, I think that, that this is the best time we've ever implemented new software. And I think we've had such success with it is because I've put it in the team's hand to build what they want to get the most out of their role. It's, I, I, I have this view that if you build a workflow system that's dependent on advisors or anybody whose role is not you know, sitting in front of the computer most of the time to go in and mark off tasks, it's going to fail because ultimately – you know, that means that there is the, the sandbag. There's the thing that's breaking it. And I think, yeah, I, I think you're spot on, which is get the team to do the driving, get them to use the system to drive you, not the other way around. And my big thing is what's not working well and what's not working well that's not detrimental to the success of the software. What mm. are the little bug bears that you find? And we have a list and, you know, we will write to the, um, the software provider and say, um, is this going to be fixed? This it would be good if a system did this or this or this. So we have our wish list, and they will tell when it, they'll just tell us when it's been going to be added to the pipeline. If it's something they can do, yeah. or if it's something they have to do from a kind of compliance level, or we'll find a solution. So we're very solutions based. So there's some things that don't work well with the system at the moment, um, and there's there's one thing we've found that we need to do a workaround for, and we found right. a workaround. So. Um, don't I, I'm very big. Don't come to me with a this. Well, this is terrible. We should just go back to the old way of doing things. What's terrible? For How sure. Do it and what's the solution? I was it. And, yeah. Is everybody in your team a, a systems thinker? Yes. And is now, that a deliberate? Is that a deliberate hiring strategy? Or does um, it just happen that way? I think it's happened that way. I think we've we we. Give people a lot of leeway because that's I like people to be able to um, come out of their shell and find what they love. So I'm very big um, on um, progressing people through business. So, you know, when Danny, um, who's my associate advisor now, when she joined me, she came from a, um, she was a risk-only para planner and then she joined me and I've thrown her into SMSF world, yeah. strategy world. And she, you, like when you get stuck in that world, especially with me, who's high level and she's detailed, um, 
you either sink or swim, right? You either work really well together. So Danny's been with me for um, seven years. <laughs> um, and then when I hired Larry, I got a resume after I had hired someone else and I was like, oh, this guy looks really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, a it was a gamble, you know. Yeah. I was putting myself out on the limb, but I just, oh, and he is just, you know, he's gone from being a power planner to my senior flat power planner and my investment um, specialist. Um, and so Danny has gone from risk only to full power planner to associate advisor. That's awesome. Um, Larry will do his professional year. Taryn, when she joined, she's done her advice study, but she's like, oh, I don't know if I want to be in the industry. So she was just off of support. Then she's moved to junior power planner and now client services admin. So it's a, a real big start and learn absolutely every process in the business. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and like I went overseas for a month earlier this year. It's the first holiday I've had in eight years where I didn't have to do anything for work other than pay the team. So, that in itself was and huge. Would you say the reason you're able to do that is because of the systems and because you've got a team who understand how systems work as part yeah. of it? So, I mean, actually, let me ask this question first. Uh, before we get to front of the systems, the strategy paper piece. Yes. If you've got, you've got businesses out there who are not doing that, or maybe, you know, sometimes I, I talk to them about that and they say, but why would I do that? I can just go straight to SOA or whatever it might be. Um, what would you say are the benefits? And I know you've always done this. What do you say are the benefits of, of for you personally in your enjoyment of the process by doing it that way? And then secondly, what would you say are the benefits to the business that you wouldn't have if you didn't do it that way? Sure. Um, the benefits to the client, I think, are they it's it's a it's a big educational piece. They walk out of a meeting either sometimes a little bit overwhelmed because it's some of the documents are quite big. It's their whole world. Yeah and what their world could look like in a document. So they, they go home with a lot of things to consider if I do it one way or do it another way or, you know, um, and we get very particular, like very granular in terms of, you know, like this is private school, this is what it's going to potentially cost. And, you know, and like we've had clients ask us to plan in when they have their baby around vesting schedules, you know. So we, we, a lot of things are time-driven um, and cash flow-driven. Um, so it's been great because clients get the education piece, which ticks the box of me helping them understand their world rather than a statement of advice, which unfortunately over time um, we, we as an industry or compliance has made it that much more um, not user-friendly. So my yeah, strategy 100%. is very user-friendly, very picture-driven, follow the bouncing ball. So they feel like they're walking away going, oh, my God, I'm actually okay or mm. I'm really excited about the next steps. When can we start? So that's helped me immensely because it gets client buy-in um, and it, it feels to me that I'm giving back to the industry. Where yeah. it's helped business um, it, and it, it has taken a while, we've now, we now we charge a, a bigger fee for these strategy documents because they're, they're, they're great um, and then we also charge for a statement of advice document. And the statement of advice is not as expensive as the strategy paper. So the strategy papers cost more? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. We're, we're, well, a lot of the work's done for the advice document at the end of the day. Yeah. We've compared products. We've done all that. So we're just taking away the things we're not doing, tweaking some things if numbers are changing, and then throwing it in. When you, when you, started, when you started to do that, did you have any... Did you have any sort of concern? Oh, how's this going to go down? Yeah, I remember going to um, a Finia conference one year and we had someone speak at an event and I was like, ah. Oh. And I've always built my business on revenue streams. So from right. the day I started, um, I when I went in 2014, I had been contracting to other practices. So I didn't take one client with me. So I started my business from scratch with right. no ongoing revenue. <laughs> so it's all new business or die. Um, so I was very particular about revenue streams. I don't always want to focus on new business risk. So I had to charge for advice. I had to charge yeah. for, I had to earn commissions and I had to charge, um, you know, um, moving forward. So we do a lot of SMSF and we outsource our SMSF administration. So I've always had these revenue streams. Um, As in multiple revenue streams. Multiple revenue like, streams. Yeah, got it. Um, and, you know, we my, every time I do my business planning now each and every year, I'm like, okay, well, what is each revenue stream worth yep. to me? 
And then I work out, well, how much time are we spending on each revenue stream? So we yep. spend more time on the, um, the strategy side of the revenue stream than anything else. So we charge for that and we charge accordingly. Um, we're a referral-based only business. And um, what that means is we get clients at all different levels. And because we're such a bespoke service, I, it was taking so much time costing out what advice would look like for people. But now we've come up with a, a, a really good model in terms of people who are just starting out versus people who want SMSFs and SMEs and yep. trusts and that, those kind of structures. Um, but it's also provides now a model where a lot of my um, team will move up to that advisor space at some point because they know the Burkhart methodology. Um, so it means that when they do start providing work, um, or being an advisor, they can start at the the not the lower end clients, but the 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 easier type strategies and price points to build them up to the really high net worth clients. That, that makes total sense. Yeah. I've got a couple of questions coming. I just noticed. Okay, everybody wants to know the software provider. Did you? Is it? I know we haven't mentioned the name. Do you want to just? Do you want to take it offline and people want to know they can email you, or did you want to? Pop I it don't online? mind. It's we're, okay. we're now using PlutoSoft. We're not under any agreements. We'd like to not. I mean, I'd love us if you all joined PlutoSoft to save Burkhart, and then they'll 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 get all our things done faster. <laughs> yeah, Greg makes the point. He said, "Look, he wants to know the CRM system. There's so much overwhelm and confusion in this space." And I want to add to that, Greg. Like I have had, I, I when Sasha told me she was going to PlutoSoft, I've had a, a business that tried it and it didn't work for them. Whereas this software system works really well for you. So it's, I think getting the name of what's out there that people not, might not be aware of is really good, but also making sure that you, you're adopting something that works for you is really key because what, what is, what is, you know, sugar for one business can be poison for another. And I'll, I'll disclaimer that and say, if it was just me building the software, I would probably be having a really terrible experience because I'm too high level for that. Whereas my team have just embraced it and they're, they're getting all the stuff that their bugbears that they want to their jobs done easier. So um, I think that's that, that you've got to make sure you get your team buy in to whatever system that you're going to use. That's crucial in making it successful. Tyson was asked, what's the strategy paper look like? Yeah, um, it's big, uh, very user friendly. I think it looks beautiful. Um, <laughs> it's divided into two sections. Uh, well, generally three, and there's a lot of, um, there could be some charts in the back with current and proposed. It, it, it's, it really looks like a mini SOA, but more user-friendly. There's no jargon. There's no all big scary what you've got to consider and so forth. It's, um, you know, if it's a, if, if it's property, there'll be a picture of a property and there'll be cash flow, what the stamp duty looks like, what's deductible, what's not deductible, uh, lots of pictures. How do you bind it? I know it's a really weird question. Do you do heat binding or? Uh, no, not really. We do have a binder in the office. I hate it. I vow I'll never bind another document again because I always stuff it up. But since we've had Zoom, um, a lot of clients will do their stuff on Zoom. So it's uh, yeah, of course. now. Um, and a lot of people want, like I've had ideas to get it on little zip drives and stuff. Um, and the good thing about Zoom, it's kind of changed things. But I mean, I'm going into the office this afternoon and presenting a really big strategy paper and that's, being bound by the team, not me. So, have you ever been tempted to do it as a PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, I have. And I have thought we, you would have. Yeah, we did start doing that. It's just way too. Um, the files are way too large. Yeah, PowerPoint's a beast, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I want to ask. Actually, we've spoken about the benefits of doing it the way you do to so the clients. To you, what are the things that if if a business is going okay? I'm going to start doing strategy papers. What are the things that you absolutely need to have in place? Otherwise, it's not going to work. Um, you've got to be focused on cash flow um, because a lot of the strategies are driven on surplus incomes. And you've got to, what I try to tell my team is clients come to us for a certain goal or requirement. We can't then just throw it into a document that has the same format that says, this is risk. This is, and by the way, you said you wanted to do this and that's at the back of the document. Yeah. So I'm very big on give the client what they want, what they came to us for, even if it's not right up front. This is what it's going to look like. So you're going to be so, in the red. This kind of answers Tyson's question. He was like, is it scenarios or recommendations? It sounds like it's scenarios. 
yeah, it's scenarios. So you've you've come to us and we've seen that you've got these. This is your current um, cash flow. You should have around about fifteen thousand dollars a month left over. Yeah. To spend. This is your current asset base. This is your liabilities. This is your net wealth. And then the system now, when they log into the client portal, will have their net wealth. And then every year we show them how much that net wealth has grown. Um, from there. Um, it's got their properties and then we I, I have core logic so we do um, desktop valuations on property to see potential equity left yeah. in properties um, because a lot of clients do come to us for property cash flow work um, so we, we show them their equity position and then we go to the well in the, you said you wanted to buy an investment property or buy a principal place this is your current savings. This is the equity. This is a potential strategy if you can got the serviceability and this is what the loan may look like. Re- repayments at this rate, then we stress test the repayments, especially in this market with rising interest rates. And then we go, well, look, you, you, you're in the red, so you either need to save for longer or we need to come up with a different strategy. Got it. There's a couple more questions I'm going to pull out. Daniel, I might cover yours at the end, mate, because that's quite, that's quite a big, uh, big question. Rachel. Wants to know, how long does it take your team to prepare the strategy paper? Are you just using uh, the Pluto software for this or using other systems? So Excel, we start everything from Excel um, and that's where we do a lot of our ca- calculations. Clients now enter their own information into PlutoSoft, which is great. So we give them a client login, they log in all their assets, liabilities, and that will flow through to every strategy. So we use PlutoSoft just- for... Just confirm, PlutoSoft has a built-in uh, portal, doesn't it? It does. Yep, okay. Yeah, yeah it does. So, And then you've, you've got your built-in portal for everyone to fill out their fact find, but if they're in a, for all that ongoing, we pay for the premium portal, and that has all their modelling on there as well that they can look through. Ah, I, I honestly think that'll be – that when that catches on in a big way, that'll be the end of SOS. So why do you need it? Um, Daniel White, how do you deal with super in a strategy paper? And his point, I don't know whether you're in the same licensee. Compliance generally says if you mention super, it, it's product, so it's an SOI. Yeah, so we don't, we just say this is your super, this is your risk analysis, this is how much it's costing you, your binding nominations, are, you've got unitized cover and decreasing, blah, blah, blah. Yep. Um, if we've compared that against other funds and you may be able to get a cheaper rate and these are the performance and these are, you know, or if you wanted to go retail, this is what it looks like. Or if you want to go SMSF, this is what it, this is what it may look like. So there's lots of maze. There's no product names on what companies they're going to go to um, at all. It's just this, we've compared it against two retail funds. We've got retail one fund, retail two fund. We know what they are because we've, and then they can change depending on the client. And then we've got two industry funds on our APL, so we can also compare against those two industry funds without actually telling you who they are. But I can look at the the fees and know who they are. So no mention of Host Plus Super anywhere. No. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask a couple more questions. I'm very mindful of time, and I know you'll you'll have a busy day behind you, behind you, in front of you, in front of you. Um, I wanted to ask about this. Obviously, is a very time intensive. Yes. And I know you're a very personable person so therefore i imagine you have a very strong relationship what are you doing over the next few years where are you taking the business in terms of trying to alleviate alleviate some of that if if you are yeah so software is a big thing on our list to get the software right um and the education i mean you know once you know the strategies that you build we've got fairly good templates so it really is you put that in the document and you fill out the areas and it's all cash flowed out through the modelling. So it's a lot easier to put together now. Um, we get thrown curveballs a lot um, with clients. We have a lot of expat clients. We have a lot of um, US citizens. So we've got to take into effect death taxes and, and stuff <laughs> as well. Um, vesting schedules. So every time we have something new, if we spend a lot of work working on a strategy with that, it, jo- it joins that strategy template of potential strategies that may come into our world at any certain time. So we don't have to always reinvent the wheel. Um, we loom all that. So if we're going through a strategy and new people are joining, we loom it. So we're having a bit a bit of a data bank of what stuff. Um, we ask tech people all the time, you know, CFS tech and um, our licensee in strategy. Um, we find different um, products that aren't on our APL that are best interest for client and then we fight to get them added as a <laughs> or Fair enough. Fair um, enough. on the list. If it's, if, if, if it's in a client's best interest, we'll move mountains to get it to get it done. Mm. Um, 
And yes, we do a lot of research and we try to explain to our clients what does that look like. So we're very hands-on saying we've spoken to all these fund managers or all these platforms or all these people in the last month. This is some of you, this is what some of your ongoing fees go for. Because it's not just about, you know, what they see at the end of the day. It's what but what happens behind the scenes and you know, yeah. everyone's been impacted in the last 10 months, some way or another. So I'm going to read between the lines and go. This is not a business. This is not a model that you can run at a at a at anything other than a premium price. It's a premium service. It's a premium advice. It costs premium prices, and it, it works because of that. Yeah, and so, clients buy in because they've got that relationship and they know yeah. my team. It's like you know, if you've got an investment question, you can't get to me. You ring Larry. If you've got questions about this, you call Olivia, the office manager, or Tara. So it's very personable. Yep. It's, it's building a family network rather than just, you know, a service. Would you be willing to say what you stand, what you charge as a range for the strategy paper? You don't have to if you don't want to? Yeah, no. Um, so depending on level, so um, a minimum costs um, for strategy advice at the very bottom end is around about three and a half grand and at the top end is about 10. Still pretty reasonable, I think. Um, okay, penultimate question. Where, how do you feel about where the industry is going? Is there anything that keeps you up at night or are you generally pretty excited about things? What, what do you think we've, we've got ahead of us? I'm, I'm actually quite confident and very excited about where the industry is heading, which is kind of strange because I'm a little bit scared with the new government coming in. Um, I, I think it's really positive um, at the moment. Um, I hope, um, you know, I've, I've done all the education standard and FASIA and all that and, you know, I, I'm 100% over the media. Um, it drives a lot of fear in this country uh, and it's something that you can't change but I just wish they'd focus on them for a while rather than um, give the industry a bit of a chance to to catch up because yeah. what I've found since COVID is we're finally, but before COVID I was deep in uni, deep in FASIA study, yeah. deep in all that kind of stuff all the new system requirements and compliance, running a business was crap. But then yeah. out of that and then you've got COVID hits, I felt for the first time in years we're actually sitting there giving clients what they need and yeah. they need it. And I, I think that's, we've been, I've, I know for one we've been running the business ever since then, just we, we don't have a moment to put our head up because clients are wanting a seeking advice. So I'm excited about that. It changed everything. It's just, it's, it's a weird storm. I mean, the education, I almost forgot about the education. And I know you were doing a uni degree and you're going through this and, and then we come out the other side and suddenly the whole, the whole attitude towards advice has changed. You've got all these people are motivated. Uh, and I just, oh, we, we kind of, on this journey, the next two years are going to be really interesting, I think. Yeah, I've never had someone fill out their fact find as quick as I have anymore. I think COVID, people working from home, they've got access to their staff. You That's know. true. It's, That's um, so true. Yeah, they're buying in and they're not. So I, I, I would like to hear more good news stories rather than the doom and gloom all the time. And Agreed. That, that industry, I think we all need to start spreading that. All right, i got one more question. But first, uh, ladies and gents, I want you to do me a favour. Can you please jump over the QA and just give us a bit of feedback? What has been the most useful thing you've taken from well, the one thing that you know Sasha's uh, provided with you that you 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 know you you've got insight into or alternatively you know you think you can go and implement it. just give us a sense of what's really worked for you personally and while people are doing this I'm just going to ask Sasha if if people wanted to to learn more about your model they want to connect with you or what what's the best way or if there's something you want them to you know do in order to 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 move their business forward what would you, what would that be yeah, uh, look, I'm a big advocate of this industry and we all need good advisors and, um, you know, are happy to share what I know to anyone. Um, I'm Reach out on LinkedIn. You've got my website. Um, uh, you know, Sasha at Burkhardt is my email address. Just get the spelling right. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I might not get it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm an open book. Uh, I'm big in the share space because I think, you know, there's, there's too many clients for us all to handle and I That's can't true. handle everyone. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, no, happy to share. I know it's been, it's quite a journey and the overwhelm is crazy. 
Um, so I do understand that. It, it is. But you know what? I reckon the people that are still here in the industry and still pushing forward, they're doing it because they're passionate about it. And ultimately, they believe that the future is going to be better than the past. And, and I think I think if you're still here, I think the rewards are going to start coming sooner. I mean, they're already starting to come, but I think they're something coming sooner or later. Daniel said it's good to see um, someone, a woman doing it so well. And advice, totally agree. Although there's some really great female planners out there and, and great female entrepreneurs. Do you, you and Daniel know each other? Sorry, my dog just decided to come in and say hello. <laughs> I apologize. Open the door. <laughs> that's, how's he going? Is he, is he, is yeah, he recovering? He's better. He's better. Okay, that's good. Thank um, you. Greg Sorry, says, I that question. No, no. Um, he, um, Daniel said that it was just, it's just really good to see a woman killing it and vice. Agreed. Thank you. Um, Greg uh, says, emphasize, what he's taken from is emphasizing where the value truly is in the strategy, planning, and formulation. Amen to that one. Totally agree. Um, Tyson says for Brenton and I at no point does the process stop I totally agree that's his, the, Tyson is part of a business that's got a, an accounting arm uh, a, a finance arm and an advice arm so I agree with that one Daniel says that people other people are looking into this sort of thing seems to be best practice in the industry probably undercharging those two things are, are absolutely spot on Daniel yeah you can't run this as a as a, as a, as a low cost offering uh, Rachel building an amazing team agreed getting the best out of them involving in your whole business work on your process and find your tech I think that's pretty much the summary of the webinar in in, in a sentence uh, general modeling Daniel's taken for it. Rachel says she loves the idea of getting the team out of the office to work on processes I'd love to see the strategy paper I bet you would <laughs> uh, Daniel says he doesn't know Sasha sorry I thought you guys must know Sasha. and uh, Elizabeth says yep great girls do it good absolutely agree um, anything else you'd like to add uh, Sasha this has been absolutely amazing as I knew it would be yeah, um, there was only one question I didn't answer that I saw in there a couple of times. How long does a strategy pa paper take? How long yeah. does it take a string? If they're getting quicker <laughs> and quicker and quicker, sometimes they take a couple of days. Um, I've spent um, on a client who um, has owned his own small business um, commercial property that's had like a, he bought it for 275000 and now it's worth $2.8 I've like worked on that strategy to in specie it to super and stuff. So that was like 16 hours of my time, which they pay for. So it really depends on what a client wants. Um, but regular, maybe six to 10 hours, depending if the process is right. Do you lock yourself away for that? The big stuff I do. And then oh, I yeah. get someone always to check my work because I my brain thinks really, really fast. So I'm big yeah. picture. So if I'm getting really granular with numbers, I'll always get one of my team to, to make sure I haven't done I, it. I think the last thing when you've been through and done a piece of work like that is you want to do is go back and check your numbers. It's just exhausting. I get you on that. Sasha, as, as Rachel said, absolutely awesome. Thank you so much as always. And uh, you have a great weekend and I'll catch up with you soon. You too. Thanks. See you. See ya. Bye. Bye. 